Today on In Grace, we're in Shiloh to give you a Shiloh Dig 2023 update. Everybody, we're back in Shiloh, one of the most amazing places in the entire world. Why? We are in the biblical heartland of Israel, and Shiloh is the heart of Israel. This is where the capital was for Israel for over 300 years. The tabernacle was here. So many Bible stories happened here, and there's a dig going on. Yep, we are going to cover the Shiloh dig 2023 to find out what they had found on this very last day of a month long dig. In just a few minutes, two big buses full of volunteers and a van full of archeologists is gonna arrive and we're gonna follow them in and show you what they found here at Shiloh. Awesome, awesome stuff. You're gonna love it. Just like to say hi to all the Ingrace viewers this morning. Come to Shiloh, Jeremiah 712. We're trying to find the corners of this monumental building, which your theory would be it's the tabernacle or the platform of the tabernacle. And this corner is really interesting. So this is the, what, southeast corner? This is our southeast corner. And we have the other three corners, clearly. Uh, when we're coming down here, we've come upon a fire pit or a silo. And this has happened also in one of the other corners where in the Roman period, they dug that out and built something on top of it. Underneath it, we found the wall. And so that's what we're gonna anticipate that we'll find here. And you would know that by some of the ash that you can see here at the bottom dating that. That's and that'll right. tell you what era that ash was burned. That's right. We'll be able to date that and um, assuming we get good clean carbon samples plus the pottery coming out of it. Now, this is a new square, right? You knew, you thought this would have been the, the corner by measurement by other corners you found. What else did you find here? Well, we have um, the socket stone for a door. And when we anticipated the dimensions of the building, I estimated that the door would have been here. When we came down just about half a meter, there was the socket stone of the door in place. And that's really important because the Bible mentions architectural features. When you get features like a gate or a door or a wall in the text, you would love to find confirmation. The socket stone was exactly where we anticipated it would be. So a socket stone is something that would hold a, a wooden post that would swivel the door. And you're only finding these on, especially something of that size, like a gate of a city or a door of a big building. So you're calling this a monumental building. It's you know larger walls, the dimensions are right, the layout is the correct layout for the tabernacle. But usually we're thinking tabernacle, it's a tent, you know? Right. So how would there be then a building instead of a tent or is there something like a hybrid that they were using? Well, apparently it was a hybrid. I had dignitaries from the IAA, the Israeli Antiquities Authority here a few days ago. And after we walked through it, they said, We've never seen anything like this. A monumental building from the Iron One period that's east-west and has all of these features that we're talking about. They said, how could it not be the tabernacle? Why would you have two structures at the same time with the same dimensions? One of the things that's important, Jim, as you watch the sunrise in this direction is you notice the building is east-west. Mm. If it had been north-south, we wouldn't have even considered it. But those things start lining up, the orientation of the building, the cultic material that we're finding around it, the socket stone in place, we begin to have a solid theory that this was indeed the tabernacle. And it was referenced to be walls, not just a tent. Now they would have had a tent over the very top. So it's still a tabernacle. It's still not yeah. a permanent dwelling place for God that David wanted to build eventually. Sort of a quasi, like we talked about when we were down in the tabernacle of David, in the, in the city of David, walls with a tent over it. It seems to be what we have here. The first hint comes from the text itself in 1 Samuel 3. At the beginning of the chapter, you're reading about the curtains of the tabernacle. By the end of the chapter, you're reading about the walls of the tabernacle. Then we go to the Mishnah, the Seder Olam and the Zabayim, both say that a permanent structure was built at Shiloh with a tent over it as a roof. Then along come archeologists here, 3,100 years later, and we uncover a building that matches that description. That's not a coincidence. That's what we call verisimilitude. And then Samuel uh, talks about going to the door of the tabernacle. So if this is it, and that's where you would expect to find it. This is where you would enter for the, the holy place, right? 
That's right. And then eventually getting into the Holy of Holies, which we're going to, let's go on all four corners. Okay. We started on this one. Take us to the next corner, right. and then we'll we'll continue on. We started with the, the least impressive corner, and we'll work our way to the most impressive, okay? If this is the least impressive, <laughs> we have a great program today. All right. Let's go to the next one. Okay, so we're standing at the northeast corner of this monumental building. You can see the wall comes all the way across from our area H, comes under the pathway, comes here and forms a corner. So when we did the dimensions from the biblical text of where the corner should be, we anticipated that, we opened a square here, and there was the corner. That's amazing because your theory then is verified at least in this little instance I know, are you hesitating to call it? I mean, you still need mm. to go another season or two, but it's it's looking better and better, right? Well, it does. Each season, we feel stronger about this. Um, I've not made it a secret that we're excavating this building, but we can't be positive at this point, but I'm pretty close to positive. Um, people sometimes use the term biblical archaeology as a pejorative, but not for me. Um, the Bible gave us the dimensions, archaeology, showed us exactly what the Bible was talking about. Now, some people would expect the tabernacle to be either at the bottom, and that's kind of been the theory, or at the top. And this is kind of not in either one. So why, why would this be the height of the tabernacle? Very interesting. In Jerusalem, the Temple Mount is not the highest elevation either, okay? As the mountains round about Jerusalem, so the Lord is round about his people. I think it's here because the big fortification wall is right there. So you want to be inside the wall so your sacred structure is protected. Okay, so you're looking at our dividing wall here. So you're standing, if our hypothesis is correct, you're in the Holy of Holies. So the Ark of the Covenant would have been here for over three centuries. That's pretty awesome. And the floor has now been identified. Beneath it is bedrock. You can even see pottery in the bulk there. So the pottery shows us that this dates to the Iron Age I period or the period of Samuel and Eli at, at Shiloh. So look at the preservation, Jim. That's over two meters that has been preserved of this building. That's more than we were hoping for. And it, it comes across here. And unfortunately, we have this big terrace that we've had to cover for safety for now. Later, we'll do more excavation. A large wall came across here you can pick it up over here. See that big wall? Yep. Mm -hmm. That's from the New Testament period. Mm. They built right on top of the tabernacle walls, and it's massive. Mm. We had to go way down to see the corner. Okay, Jim, this is our southwest corner. And you can see where the large early Roman or New Testament period wall sits right on top of this earlier wall, and it meets up here. Okay. So that's the corner we were looking for. And next season, of course, we'll have to go back and do more. But with the math, having the other corners then, we were able to do the math and give us the fourth corner. So here is the southwest corner. That's right. Of the tabernacle and the southwest corner of the Holy of Holies, if this is the tabernacle. Again, you're, you're continuing to go down, looking for artifacts, pottery, Dating, you can date right. a lot of these things. We get carbon dating. We have our ceramic dating. We're hoping even for glyptic remains, something <laughs> that's written. <laughs> we have this, this really big wall coming across here. This is our back wall, our western wall of the structure. And that's the corner that we've been looking for. Just yesterday, we found this clasp from here that could relate to the tabernacle. Tim Lopez has been supervising this area and has done a really good job of showing us the stratigraphy or the layering. So that's very critical to our dating system. And then you also have a square outside. And is that where you're saying the house? It, it's a little beyond that. Okay. We're not sure what's here yet. Okay. Uh, Boyd Seavers is supervising this area and we want to understand what was going on right next to the tabernacle. Remember the Bible talks about Samuel being next to the house of the Lord and another place it sounds like he's actually in the house of the Lord. Mm -hmm. So we kind of want to see what's going on there. All right, so we are now in the final corner. Jim, this is really well preserved. The wall we looked at from the other side, 
Here it is coming across, right okay? This is our wall 10. Okay. Why does it dip down like this? Hmm. Because there was a huge New Testament period wall that cut through here that we've uh, now removed. Uh, and on top of that was a big Byzantine wall. So we've removed this big Byzantine wall, this big early Roman wall, and here's the corner right here. So you have like a three-dimensional puzzle on your hands. That's right. From centuries of apart. Yeah. How do if you, someone how do you likes keep... a good jigsaw puzzle, we have the ultimate jigsaw puzzle. How do you here. keep track? Well, it's it's really interesting because we we have to determine which walls are from which time period using construction techniques. We have like header and stre stretcher type construction in one period and interlocking construction. So we we then use the pottery along with that and then other metrics like carbon dating and so forth. We're even using a new technology this year called luminescence testing, where we test the soil. When the soil is exposed to sunlight for the first time since antiquity, we get a reading off of it. Hmm. And this is phenomenal. It's very accurate. So it matches the dating that we're getting from our ceramic analysis as well. Wow. So here we are kind of low tech, you know, guys right here digging next to us. And then the, the hard sciences interface with us on a daily basis. Now this, item is pretty cool. And this was just found. Just yesterday in the square right next to us. So this just came out of the dirt from how many thousands of years ago? Okay, so we're gonna analyze it today, but um, this is either from Iron Age one or from the Bronze Age. So both would relate to the tabernacle period. Um, Kevin Larson's team excavated this and they put it together last night, you know, so we can get a look at it. We'll, of course, do a complete reconstruction because we even have the base. Huh. It's rare to find the lid with the vessel hmm. intact. So, Jim, why don't you take the lid off? Let's see what's in here. Okay. Do you wow. see those holes yeah. in the side and then the hole in the lid? Sure. So that there's holes here. And they line, it looks like they li would line up with these holes. Exactly. Huh. And then you fasten them and now you have a secure lid. You keep bugs out of your, your stuff. Amazing. So this is the type of stuff that was used in daily life, but it's next to this monumental building. So it's not it's common in one sense, but it's not common in another because Samuel may have used this vessel. Yeah. Oh, that's so cool. Beautiful. I've never seen anything like this. It's rare. Huh. And I love how that just fits so perfectly on there. Well, you know, the Bible compares us to clay vessels in many places. God is the potter, us is the clay, and he fits us just right, mm. doesn't he? Yeah, sometimes it doesn't seem like it, but he knows what he's doing. Yeah. Uh, this is an area that is really exciting because it's a sacred bone deposit or it's called a favisa. Right. And you started doing some work here last year. This is a very extensive now dig and what has been discovered from area D. We have about 100,000 bones that we anticipate are gonna come out of this area. Um, every day, bones and pottery from the time of Joshua. They dump these bones after the sacrificial process. They come to the edge of the city outside the camp and this becomes a sacred deposit. The bones are disproportionately from the right side of the animal, interestingly. No pig bones in here, only kosher animals. And as we're bringing down these balks, in each balk, we find the, the bone levels in a microstratigraphy, like it's been laid down over time, because you have three centuries of a sacrificial system taking place here. We don't have this in Jerusalem, okay? Here we get to actually see for the first time what the sacrificial system was like. This was discovered some years ago, but not identified. Uh, it's just a, a bone deposit or a bone pile. You've identified it because of the fact of its proximity to this you know, potential tabernacle site, this would make sense to be at the same level. You're not gonna be carrying up a hill or whatever, you know. so that right. makes sense. And then also you're finding not only the kosher and mostly right side of these animals, but you're also finding other things that could be offerings as well. Explain the pottery and the other objects. Well, the pottery is datable, and we can date it back to the time of Joshua. So what we would call late Bronze Age II pottery. And along with this, we have so far four gold objects from this area. Now, that's very rare. People don't lose gold in antiquity. Having that concentration of gold stars is what they are. Um, that's not an accident. I've had two archeologists visit this week from other digs and they've told me in their entire career, they've never found gold. 
we have four pieces out here, about one a week, once a week we're getting a piece of gold. So new discoveries this year, uh, more gold. And again, you're finding the same things that you would expect to find here with the kosher animal bones. Describe a little bit about the gold. Like, why would they be here? What might have happened for them to end up here? Let's think about the sacrificial process. You come to Shiloh and you want to reconnect with God and with other people through the shedding of blood. It's not just the animal sacrifice, there's a libation also. So the vessels that we find here are mostly restorable vessels. They can all be put back together. That's very rare. Mm. That tells us that these are libations. The, the drink offering has been poured out and then the vessel has value. The vessel itself is broken. It's broken, so you would expect to find the entire vessel in pieces, but here, where if you break a vessel in your kitchen, you're gonna be throwing it out. You're not gonna find everything in that one location. So that's, again, indicative of this being a sacrifice area or area of deposit of sacrifice. Right. Well, when they broke vessels, they would reuse the broken pieces for other things. They would grind them up and use them as inclusions in clay or as messages and all kinds of things that they would use them for. Whereas here, nobody's using these because they're sacred. Wow. The gold that's with it, Jim, is I believe that these are offerings. Okay, so people are bringing something of great wealth. They don't have, they can't go to tabernacle.org and make a contribution. They don't have checks to write. They don't have cash. They don't have coins yet. What they do have is gold. Wow. And so they're bringing these gold stars and along with the animal sacrifice and the libation, they're giving a great financial gift. Hmm. Now, do you have an example of some of the bones that have been found here? I, I do. Let me show you. This is Jordan McClinton, who's our square is this supervisor one right here? for this area. So is this just uncovered? Just here. Okay, so here's another one. Scott just handed to me, hot off the presses. Okay, so there you go. This is what you're finding as you excavate through here. We clean these, we wash them, label them, and if possible, we extract collagen from them so that we can carbon date them. Huh. That was something that was never done before here at Shiloh. Have, have, have these been carbon dated yet from last year? No, we're okay. just now extracting the collagen, okay. Okay. but these bones have been processed. So you can see uh, they've been cleaned, cleaned they're being dried. studied. Okay, and you actually have a zoo archeologist on site this That's year, right. which is brand new. That's How right. helpful has that been? Well, it's extremely helpful because he is then enabling us to identify the species of the animal, male and female, age of the animal. Like for example, in the other squares on site, when we get animal bone, they're older animals uh, showing the pathologies like they were work animals, huh. the, they were huh. bearing burden. Sure. Here you have young animals uh -huh. and disproportionately from the right side of the, of the animal. So all of this is very, very helpful to us in understanding the sacrificial system. So the right side of the animal is significant because you read in, in uh, Leviticus, Leviticus mm -hmm. that the, the priest would receive the right side of the animal. As and their that's portion. who lives here as Shiloh, or the priests. Uh -huh. um, Hannah and Elkanah, they come to visit, probably live in tents while they're here, but the priests live here, and now we find this disproportion. So Shiloh's central, uh, it's the heartland, it's the heart of Israel, tabernacle, the worship. People would come here three times a year, sitting on these hills. The sun is coming up. You are a fortunate man, Scott Stripling. Well, we're very blessed. And you are too, Jim Scudder. Underneath your feet is about another half meter of an excavated bone, and it's solid bone. Wow, it's and a, gold. Right, right here, Maybe. Probably, probably gold right underneath your feet. Huh. So in the coming seasons, we'll continue to excavate this favisa, and in the end, we'll analyze it, we'll publish it, and it helps us understand the overall picture of life in biblical times. So cool, so cool. I know, Scott, that when we were filming here in years past, you were excited because you thought that maybe you'd found one of the features that you're looking for, one of the main features that archeologists wanna find, and that's a gate. But I think you were thinking maybe it was a, a back gate, yeah. side gate. You found something completely <laughs> different and yeah. massive. This is really exciting, Jim. You, you have the glacé over here, this earthen embankment that surrounds the site and protects the foundation from an enemy digging it out. Okay. When we came down here, we got this massive wall and we realized there was no glacé in this area. That was my first clue that maybe there was a hint here. 
Mark Hessler's been supervising this area from the beginning, and there was a terrace way over our heads here that we've come down through. Huh. The next thing that we saw was this opening in the wall back here. Okay. That may be curious, like why would you have an opening in the wall when the whole point of a wall is to keep people out? The next season, we came down further, and then last season, we got these pillars beginning to emerge. Huh. They're parallel with that big wall. There's five courses of these massive pillars intact here. So we still haven't reached the bottom here. We now see a wall going across, forming an L. So I think we're in the outer gate chamber of ancient Shiloh, the gate that's mentioned in the Bible. And you have a gate, and we usually think of a gate as just a gate, an opening, but right. these were multi-chamber gates and a lot was going on within, within the gate, obviously. We've talked about that previously, but this is incredible, all the things that have been uncovered. So explain a little bit about the style of gate that you're starting to see here. Okay, we, we think this is an arm. You have that massive Bronze Age wall. Now we have the cross wall coming over here, forms this big chamber. And, and gates in antiquity are sort of like a flea market, okay? There's all this bartering and tables and booths set up out here. Even foreigners can come into the outer gate and barter, but they can't come into the inner gate, okay? So this is sort of a, a separation from sac sacred to most sacred space. So you have justice in the gate, economics in the gate, worship even sometimes, and of course its main function is security. Do you have any other examples in this land of a similar style gate. Uh, Megiddo, you see this big outer gate, which is like what we would call an agar or market within that gate, and then you have the inner gate, in that case, a Solomonic gate that you would be going through. This predates Solomon's time. So instead of finding a little back gate, you found the gate at Shiloh. Right. How big is that? For well, you guys? I mean, it's really big. If you would have asked me at the beginning of the excavation, Scott, in your perfect world, what would you uncover? I would have said, well, the gate and the tabernacle. And lo and behold, it appears that in our field, we have both of those features. And again, the gate is talked about in the Bible, a really sad episode of Eli the high priest, hearing bad news mm. and falling and dying. And yeah. this would have been the location of that. The loss of the Ark of the Covenant, the loss of his sons, and then the loss of his life. And then, his, of course, his daughter-in-law gives birth, and the, the baby is called Ichabod. The glory of the Lord has departed. Yeah. So it's a faith lesson in, in there that there are consequences for our actions. Yeah. All right, so now we're in the inner gate. So point out some of the features. Okay, you come into the inner gate of the city and this is where justice would be meted out. The elders are sitting in the gate of the city. You have an inset chamber here. The way this big wall is formed is 5.3 meters wide. You've got a solid meter on the outside, a solid meter on the inside, and normally it's just rubble that fills the wall on the inside. So we call this wall 1A, 1B, and 1C. All together it's wall one. But notice here, this isn't rubble, that's, that's laid courses of stone. Mm -hmm. So you're seeing this inset here. Of course, it would have been nicely finished. And then we have the same thing over here. You see that solid laid stone, not just this rubble that we would normally find. And then most interestingly, Jim, is right behind you, this chamber. And that's an inset chamber within the inner gate. And this is where you can picture that the leader or the ruler of the city, in our case, Eli, uh, would have been sitting. We also have the Amarna letters that tell us that Silu was a very interesting city and a man named Turbasu, who was the Egyptian governor, who was overthrown by the Habiru, most likely the Hebrews, was slain in the gate of Silu. Mm. So we not only have the death of Eli, but we also have the death of Turbasu, this Egyptian ruler who was also slain here. Wow, the history comes alive. So you can see now, how people entered the city from the north, they come in through the outer gate, through the inner gate, and then hopefully next season we'll get clarity on how they then entered into the city. And not far up the hill is the monumental building. Is the building. monumental building. And what are these? You're standing in the storage rooms hmm. over here. Those then become the storage rooms for the tabernacle. So if you're picturing Eli sitting here in this inner gate chamber, right. and he's looking for the runner to come to bring news, well, there's the road right there. And that's the modern road, but these are following the ancient, the road yeah. of the Patriarchs. They're actually a, about to change the name of this to the Patriarchs Highway. Wow. And so you can see where the runner would have been coming from Afek, 26 miles away, 
And when Eli sees that and then he gets the news, this tragedy probably plays out right where we are. And you can actually still see the destruction layer? There. Yeah, you, if you look up here, okay, so you can see the stratigraphy here. See the color at the bottom, just above bedrock. Mm. Above that, what do you see? It looks like a, a destruction layer, burn that's, layer. That's exactly what it is, a, a thick destruction layer. And again, we're carbon dating that. Above that, you've got a different color of soil. Above that, a different color of soil. So this is what we're looking for while we're excavating, the changes of, of texture, of color, and we're doing samples in each level. We do flotation on the soil to get the seeds out of it and everything. That tells the story. Hmm. Wow. Now, if you like the macabre, Jim, I wanna add one more <laughs> death to the story, okay? All right. When the Danish were excavating here in the 1930s, their dig director, Hans Kier, who was a great archeologist for his time, he was working right behind us where these gals in the blue shirts are, and he became mortally ill and never recovered. So we have Eli's death, Turbasu's death, and the death of Hans Kier. So when I send people to this area to work, they know they're not on my good side, okay? <laughs> well, guess they, where you are. Yeah, I was gonna say, they say there's gonna be four <laughs> deaths here, so. <laughs> no, I'm just saying, they're waiting for the next shooter drop. All right, so now we're standing where, Scott? This is Area C. Okay, and this was excavated how many years ago? In the 1980s, Israel Finkelstein excavated this area for bar Ilan University. He found rooms behind us here that he interpreted as massive storage rooms because there were big storage jars on the ground level of each room. They're depicted here in, in this uh, graphic. Um, I see it a little bit differently. They, I mean, they could have been storage rooms, but I see these as Israelite houses, what I would call phase two of the Israelite house. The first one, like what we had at Kerbin al a very simple one-room house with maybe a tent adjacent to it. This I would see as phase two. You can begin to see the development of the house. They're building against the, the fortification wall. And then phase three is what we call the four-room house. And they're everywhere then in the Iron Age II period. Because there were storage jars doesn't mean these are storage rooms. Every Israelite house would have had storage jars in their, in their basement. And you can see how they're, they're depicted here. The reason this is, I think you're gonna find this really interesting is because there are no domestic structures at Shiloh before that monumental building is built, but we know people are living here because we have all the evidence of it. The, that biblical idea that how can I build myself a house while the Lord himself is still living in a tent? So initially, the tent is here at Shiloh. When they build the building, now we begin to see domestic structures appear for people like Eli. And dating uh, this date would be the same as same the date, date of the monument. At Iron Age 1. And so the, the tabernacle platform is just around the corner. So you're right here. If, That's right. If this is where Well, Eli they would have had ladders coming out of here, or oh. steps or ladders, so they literally could have just gone right up from there. Amazing. This is Abigail Levitt. She's the assistant director here at the Dig in Shiloh, and you've had quite an exciting season here. We have. And Today's the, the last day. What's the season number? Uh, this is our fifth season. Fifth season, okay. And you get to show us some goodies here, huh? Yeah, so I'm also the objects registrar, so when people dig things up on the site, and I come around and collect them in my little box, and I get to see all the fun stuff. Uh. Um, so this is a sling stone that came out. Worked flint stones into nice round balls that, you know, you think David and Goliath, um, and that's a sling stone. So is that, is that, it seems big to me. So is this a bigger sling? Is this more of a, we a bigger weapon? So um, this is actually a medium-sized stone. Is it really? Stone. Um, but think, this is probably from the Roman period, Roman military. Okay. Um, so when the Jews revolted in the first century AD and the Romans came in to kind of squelch the rebellion, this is what they would have been slinging at the local inhabitants. And this was found approximately where? Up near the Jewish homes, um, up kind of on the top of our area. And the Romans did attack this area then, so. They did, wow. yeah. That's sad. Mm -hmm. Okay, interesting artifact. Yeah. Good so screen. here's a smaller find, um, and this is a nice one. It will need to get it clean, but it's a bronze earring. They call it a lunate earring, hmm. um, and it would have had a, a wire that's broken off that would go through the ear. Um, this is very popular 
in the Bronze Age, the Canaanite period here. So before um, Israel got here. Before Israel, but even during, okay. e even continuing into the, the Israelite period. What would, have the, what would that have looked like new? What would the color have looked like? Um, like copper color? It's bronze. So, I mean, today we always see it as green, but I think it would have been a, a shinier, mm. um, shinier, maybe even yellow color. And so do you, do you know, was this found in situ, in dry sift or wet sift? Um, this was our metal detectorist, uh, uh, and she actually found it when she was walking down the path. So, wow, really? Yeah, that's fantastic. Uh, so this would have been in someone's ear, mm -hmm. decorative. Mm -hmm. Would they have had other uh, nose rings or other type of rings too? In yeah, antiquity? I think I think nose rings were popular as well. Um, I'm not sure about other piercings, but mm -hmm. for sure, for mm -hmm. sure, ear and nose. Now here's a really nice find. We actually hadn't found any of these until this season. It's a, it's well known archaeologically. Um, these are conical seals, so it has a hole drilled, so you could wear it from a necklace. Um, and then on the bottom, there's some design that you can stamp. You can stamp it into a lump of clay or something. So this one is just a uh, sort of a geometric design. Sometimes they have um, designs that might have someone's name or something. Uh, we always hope for that, but um, this one has a nice kind of checkerboard pattern mm. on the bottom. So then someone that would be making pottery or something like that, would this be a maker's mark or something like that? I don't think it's for pottery. It's a little small. Um, okay. I think it would be um, like to seal like a clay lump on on a document. Oh, okay, okay. To seal a document. Okay. Huh. That's really neat. So that's a really nice piece. Is it made out of stone or out of clay? I think this one's stone. Huh. I think, yeah. yeah. It's a soft, chalky stone, nice for and carving. And that's the first of that we Of found that type at that we found at Shiloh, yeah. It's known from other sites. Um, and then this is a really nice find. Um, we uh, found this one over in the bone deposit area in Area D. And um, this is a scarab, so the back of it is shaped like a beetle. You can see the little face. It's got little legs on the sides, but then on the belly of the beetle, which I can't show the cameras, um, is a really pretty design, and a lot of these will have an Egyptian pharaoh's cartouche on it or something. This one doesn't have a cartouche, but it does have some hieroglyphs on it. Okay, so the reason we can't show it is basically mm -hmm. because you guys need to study it more. You need to, you know, write about it. Right. So yeah. we we can't give you more detail, but the the fact that we that you found a scarab mm -hmm. here is important. And how will that help you? Um, so scarabs are really good for dating because. They're, um, they have distinct designs from different periods, um, especially the part on the belly that actually has lettering on it, but even the, the stylistic um, part on the back and the sides, the, the beetle image um, changes over time. So, and they're, they're very Egyptian style, although some are made locally here in Canaan copying the Egyptian styles, but, um, but yeah, they're very datable, which helps us a lot. And again, was this found in, you might have just told me that, mm -hmm. um, in sifting or in digging? This one was actually found in, in digging, okay. which is the first, we found quite a few, probably a dozen scarabs here at Shiloh, and this is the first one that's been found in digging. Which is helpful because mm -hmm. you, you actually found it in place, mm -hmm. and maybe it's because it's white. What is it made out of? Um, it's called steatite. It's a kind of stone. Okay, that's uh, really Very great. common. And and when you say a scarab, mm -hmm. it is a, it's a beetle, right? Yeah, so scarab means beetle. Uh -huh. um, but yeah, it's specifically an, an amulet that's carved in the shape of a beetle. So this would be a, something that people would have to... Um, as a souvenir, but it's also mm -hmm. a, a sign of authority or what? Yeah, so this also, like the other stamp we looked at, could be used to make a stamp to seal documents or something okay. like that. Okay. Um, but it's also a piece of jewelry. But uh, really helpful dating and mm -hmm. dating these these mm -hmm. archaeological grounds. It is, okay. yeah. Here, let's put it back in the little box. Um, I'll show you one more thing. Um, and this was also out of the uh, the bone deposit. And this is a really pretty uh, mother of pearl pendant. It's just broken a little bit. Mm, um, wow. But we hardly ever find these intact. Mm. So just a really pretty piece of jewelry. We're finding all kinds of beautiful things out of that deposit, uh, richer finds than we're finding anywhere else on site. Um, so we think that that speaks to probably the, the cultic um, nature of, of that. The bone deposit probably mm. contained offerings as well as uh, the bones of animals. Yeah. So, again, to stress how unusual this is and mm -hmm. the previous gold finds that you found there, mm -hmm. uh, let me hold that for one second. Mm -hmm. uh, these are 
unusual, very unusual to find such a concentration yes. of expensive objects mm -hmm, exactly. in, in, one, in one place. Exactly. So you said mother of pearl. Yeah, I think, mm. I think it's mother of pearl. You can kind of see pearl, that, the, the that sheen to it, mm -hmm. yeah. That's gorgeous. Yeah. Wow. Okay, well, that's fantastic. Thank you so yeah. much for showing us all this. And, of course. Uh, I'm excited about all the things that you guys have found this year at Shiloh. It's been a good season. I absolutely love being at this site here in Shiloh, or as the proper pronunciation is, Shiloh. And Shiloh is used over 30 times in the Old Testament, but it's almost always used as a name of a place. But it is used one time in the Bible. I believe it to be a messianic prophecy. In Genesis 49, verse 10, it says this, The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet, until Shiloh come, and until him shall the gathering of the people be. What does that mean? Well, Shiloh probably is connected to the word shalom, which is peace, so it's this idea of tranquility. The Messiah is going to come and bring tranquility to this land that has seen so much conflict and so much war. And even today, we're in the biblical heartland of Israel in Samaria, it's still called the West Bank, and there's there's terrorism that happens in these areas. Well, there's a day when a peacecomer will come and solve the world's problems. We've tried to solve the problems of the world, we can't, it seems to be getting worse. But one day, the problem solver will arrive. His name is Jesus, or perhaps Shiloh. Do you know him? Have you received him by faith? Have you put your trust in him? He's come once to this beautiful land. He was born in Bethlehem. He did great miracles all over this land in the Galilee and Judea, but he died in Jerusalem on a cross, a willing sacrifice for our sins. And he wants to give you a gift called eternal life. The Bible says, for by grace are we saved through faith and that not of ourselves, it's a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. We can be saved from our sins, from our imperfections, from our mistakes, from our not telling the truth, our lies, all of the, the sins that we have in our lives, we can be saved from those sins because the perfect one paid for them on a cross. He died and he rose again. And if you will believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, you will be saved today and forever. Hey, I hope you enjoyed our program on YouTube. We wanna to continue to provide you some great videos on God, the Bible, and how it all connects with our world. It would really help us if you would consider subscribing to the InGrace YouTube channel. We would also like to have you comment. We will try to read and respond to them. And we also need you to hit the notification button and like the InGrace episode that you just saw. These ways will help more people hear about InGrace and more people hear the gospel of grace.